Today we're going to talk about ethics and research. I am going to ask Mike and uh, Leah to chime in as they see things that, oh, Sarah, sorry, Sarah, sorry, Sarah. And Sarah to chime in on um, things that they may have talk, be talking about in that class with Dr. Atkinson that I don't cover, okay? Um, but real quickly, how many of you are teaching public speaking? Okay, several of you. What do we mean when we say ethical listening? When we talk in public speaking about ethical listening, John, what are we talking about? Are you talking about like not putting your bias on listening to information? As like, like you're hearing the information, but you're like not, you like, you have a window there to where you're just listening to information, trying to take the information in, and then, uh, and then adding, not adding your persuasiveness, not yeah. adding your own, your own yeah. bias. Yeah. You're, you're willing to listen to what they yes. have to say, willing to recognize they may have a different point of view, a different opinion from you, right? And willing to accept that they may be very persuasive and have great evidence and great arguments, and I have two obligations. I actually have three, but I can choose to ignore it. What are we talking about here? Theory, what kind of theory are we talking about? I can choose to ignore it, I can choose to accept it, or I can choose to go do more research to support my point of view. What theory is that we're talking about? When somebody's giving you an argument that counters what you're thinking, that runs against what you're thinking, makes you a little uncomfortable, causes a little bit of cognitive dissonance. It's the theory of cognitive dissonance. You're getting information, you have a point of view, and somebody is making an argument that runs counter to your point of view. And the idea, and what they're trying to do, what they're trying to persuade you, is make you uncomfortable. Okay? And they're expecting one of three things is going to happen. You're either just going to totally write it off and ignore it. I don't care what kind of evidence they had. I don't care what kind of information they brought. I don't care how good a speaker they were or how great their presentations were. I disagree. I'm totally ignoring it. They want you to agree. Yeah, go, man, that was a great presentation. I can't argue those facts. I can't argue that data. I may have to change my point of view. I may have to change my way of thinking. Or you could go the route of, okay, they make a great point. They make a great argument. I'm still not buying it. I better go see if there's more that I agree with, more unbiased information that I agree with that, that fits my point of view to bolster my point of view so that I can make that counter argument. Okay? So when you when you're faced with dissonance, that's what you do. That's how you react. As a researcher, as an ethical researcher, you have an obligation to ethically listen. And when I say ethically listen, are you listening as you're reading the articles, as you're doing your literature review, as you're gathering your data? Well, when you're looking at documents, no, you're not listening, you're reading, but same sort of thing. But as you're doing interviews, or as you're doing a focus group, you are listening to their point of view. Okay? So we talk about when you go into your research, there's a good chance you're going to have a bias. You're going to think that the research is going to come out a certain way. You've determined there's a research problem. There's a gap in the literature. There is something going on in the world that you don't agree with. Or something going on in the world and you think, man, that's really interesting. I want to know why. I want to know why this culture developed this way. I want to know why women react this certain way. I want to know why men perform or think this way. And so you have a, a thought. And the research problem isn't necessarily a problem, it's just a question that you've come up with, okay? You all experience the world. You're all in it. So there is a good chance because you're human, you have blood flowing through your veins, you have brain cells, you're in graduate school, you have a lot of brain cells, you have a point of view. You are probably in the process of developing that point of view going to have a bias. And so when you go in to do your research, there's a good chance that you're going to go asking these people these questions and you think that you've got the answer, but no, nobody cares what you say because everybody has an opinion. They're all like armpits. Everybody's got them. They all stand. <laughs> okay. You need evidence to back up that opinion, but you need to be an ethical listener 
an ethical researcher and recognize as you're getting this data, you may find out you're wrong. You may find out that your point of view was flipped on its ear. But here's the beauty of it. When you take a test and you get the answer wrong, what happens? You lose points. You lose points. And if you get enough answers wrong, what happens? You fail the test. Researching that way. If you go out and you have a good question established, and you've done a good literature review to support that there is a question here that has not been answered, and you develop a strong methodology, you are choose the appropriate methodology, you have the right population, you are asking the right questions, you're looking at the right documents. If it turns out that your hypothesis was wrong, that's still a win because you have still added to the body of knowledge. You still have provided us information. Edison found 999 ways not to make a light bulb so we don't go back and screw up and do that again when we want to make a light bulb. That was a win. We know how not to make a light bulb now. We only needed one reason how, or one way how. You have determined this is not my thought process. What I thought was happening is not what's happening. It's this. We still have an answer. And you gave it to us because you did the right research. Okay? So, don't think I have to cheat. I have to cheat the answers. I have to throw out the ones that don't agree. I have to disregard the data that doesn't fit with my point of view. Okay? Because if I, if I don't, if I bring that in, then I'm wrong. My hypothesis is going to be disproven. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? You still won! You still provided the information. So don't think along those lines. Think about your number one job is to what? Add to the body of knowledge. Add to the body of knowledge. Whether you're right or wrong, you've added to the body of knowledge. Okay? All right. To help protect in this process, now that's what I'm talking about with being an ethical listener and being an ethical researcher, but to help in this process because oftentimes we interview people or we survey people. We're bringing people into the fold and people have emotions and people have their own stuff. As my 10-year-old son likes to say with kids who have behavioral problems or whatever, he has issues. <laughs> now, we always have to remind my son, you know, buddy, you're ADD. You've got a little pill that helps you adjust your issues. Let's not be judging other people, okay? The reason we have the Institutional Review Board is because we're dealing with people. And back in the early days of research, we would try and do research on criminals, death row patients, <coughs> Just anybody that we felt like, you know what, we could take advantage of that. We can tell them we're doing research on this, and we're really doing research on this other thing. Okay? And what happened was those people were put in danger. Not a really humane way of doing research. It even looks, I mean, you even go back and you look at animals. When we do medical research on animals, there's still supposed to be some ethical guidelines to that. Whether it's done or not, I don't do research on animals. I don't do medical research. I don't know. But we need to think along those lines. We don't want to cause undue harm. Why not? It's kind of a given, John. I mean, John's looking at me like, what do you mean, why not? <laughs> what do you say, Mike? It's unethical. It's unethical. It taints our research. Because, you know, think about how are you going to get more people to, if you've developed a reputation of using, doing inhumane research, how are you going to get subjects in the future? Well, people won't trust you in the future. People will look at your research and think, hmm, he was sketched that one time. Yeah, exactly. Who's going to want to add you? Right, like you. Yeah, the only way to add to my body of knowledge is to kind of replicate my research. Well, I don't want to go and, you know, replicate what he just did. So, that's what we have to be thinking about. Institutional Review Board came along to help prevent that sort of thing. Sometimes it's called the Human Subjects Committee because they are looking at human subjects and the subjects of our research, and is it going to protect them? Okay. 
There's three different levels. There's the full, there's expedited, and there's exempt. Full would be you have to disclose everything. I mean, you have to uh, disclose what it is you're doing with your research. I haven't done this in a while, so I can't remember what the pages look like and all the stuff that you have to include in it. But you have to get questions. You have to say who it is you're going to be researching. You're going to have to talk about what kinds of things could be happening to them, or any dangers and things like that. If you're doing full on, what you have to do with full would, probably, would basically be medical research, where physical or emotional harm could come. And you have to talk about what it is you're doing to prove that there's going to be no physical or emotional harm. Okay. Expedited would be, you know, like when I had to do expedited with mine, I was surveying sports information directors about their profession. What harm is there going to be in this? Well, the only harm could be if somebody got upset and they were realizing that they're reading through the questions, man, I have no influence at all. And they get depressed because they realize they don't have any influence in their office. As they're reading through all these questions going, God, I've wasted 15 years of my education to be a professional public relations director just writing stories. That's all I've ever done. And they quit their job. It's a stretch. Okay. <laughs> That'd be expedited. Exempt would be there's absolutely going to be no harm at all. There's no way. What is an example of that? I try to think of an example where we have to be exempt. Go ahead, Bob. I'm planning on doing a survey where I do not ask anybody their name. I just give simple demographics of age range, um, race, gender, and then questions about, then the questions will just be their opinions on things. Were you, were you told you could go exempt on that? No, I'm, asking, I'm thinking that's an example. It's probably going to be expedited still because you're asking some demographics. Because one of the questions they're asking is, is there a chance minors could be involved or pregnant women or uh, I think now they might have veterans with PSD, things like that. Uh, when I did my thesis, I went to the human subjects and made sure I didn't know if I needed to go through it. And then they said that I didn't have to because I was just interviewing these certain people about the company. So would that be exempt? That might be an because example. Because they, they told me I didn't need to go through them, that I was fine. Uh, yeah, I that, that might be an example of exempt. Even though you're talking to people, you're not asking them personal questions. You're right. just asking them, what does your job entail? Yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was just about the company and how they came to be with the company. So yeah, they're still maybe going to ask, who are you going to be asking? Are any of them minors? Are any of them? Yeah, they, they asked me those questions, and I was like, no, no, no. And I'm okay. like, okay, yeah, you're fine. You well, and, and the thing about this is, if you're unsure, mm -hmm. this is going to be the most rare. This is the one you use. Nursing students have to probably do this a lot. We're going to be doing more of these two. And it's an issue where you go to, you find out who the, um, who's on the board, and you can talk to them. Wendy Geiger has served on in our department for years. Um, talk to them about this is what I'm looking at, and they'd be able to tell you more specifically what it is, which one you need to go. Is it government sponsored? No, I mean, it's every university has one. Okay. So if you're going to do research as a student or a faculty member at that university, you have to go through it. Okay. Okay. Um, so tell you. They get a lot of requests, a lot of these, and so the more thorough that you can be, and I would say check before you start filling out your paperwork to see which one you need to do, because it can take a lot of time. Because what happens is those boards don't meet every week. They may meet every, every month, they may meet every six weeks. So if you get in the time crunch, Kind of at their mercy. Now, the, the review board when I was at Colorado State, it met a lot more quickly. It got through that one a lot more quickly because it's a research one institution. That's their primary focus is to do research. And so their board, because they're doing so much, they need more regularly. Now, they also have to look at more applications, but um, but they met more regularly. Ours does a pretty good job. It's pretty quickly. It just it depends a lot of times on can everybody get together to look over it. So I would recommend to talk, find out who's on the board, who's in your college or in your department that's on the board, and talk to them about your research and what you're doing so you fill out the right type of paperwork. Because if you fill this one out, they say, no, nope, you got to go expedite it, then you got to do it again. So when we did our interview exercise, our assignment, should we have done that? 
If you are doing this for a class assignment, no. Uh, it's the, only, the only time you have to do this is if you're going to go out for publication. Um, if you're getting this research to go publish or to go present your findings at a conference, for example, that's the only time you have to go through it. But if you're doing a class project that's only going to be within this class, no, you do not. Okay. So a thesis would be an example of that? Yep. A thesis, okay. you would have to do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, She's just fell off my cracker. Sorry. She's just fell off my cracker. No, I've never heard that one. Like it. Like it. Like it. Is it Colby Jack or is it Pepper Jack? A gerbil fell off the wheel. I had something spinning. A gerbil fell off the wheel. Stopped. I lost my train of thought. I think he said Jesus fell off the rocker. Hang on. I had to write that down. Hang on. Hang on. Jesus fell off the rocker. Is it Pepper Jack or Colby Jack? Okay. I'll come back to it. But yeah, the purpose, the purpose of the Institutional Review Board is to protect, protect the innocent. Okay? Just got the cheese back on my cracker. You need to think about, are you going to ensure anonymity? I'm not on drugs again today, Leah. Are you, are you, I'm going to have to edit so much. Are you going to ensure anonymity or confidentiality? What's the difference? What's the difference? Confidentiality is you know who the people are, but you don't share that information with the readers. And and then that word is you don't and even any. yes. <laughs> you don't even know <coughs> who the respondents are. Yeah. So I can do a survey and ask you to put your names on it and you give me the data, but I'm not gonna use your names in my write-up. Anonymity, I don't even know who they are. You're not even signed a number, and what's happened in the past is when they did paper once, they would put a little number down in the corner, and they would have a list of people they were surveying so that they could come back and they know who the name was, which... That's unethical. <laughs> Especially if you say... Blurring the lines a little bit, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you tell somebody that it's anonymous and you don't make it anonymous, that's a flat-out lie. Yeah. I don't see how there's a <coughs> Yeah. It's not even blurry. It's not even gray like the sky. Thing with uh, why would you want to do the an an anonymity versus the confidential? Well, because if you do have that bias and you knew something about somebody or you thought you knew something about somebody, then you, you may not be listening ethically to what they're stating in their in their survey. Or, okay, or I'm, I'm thinking more on the data collection side of it. Yeah. I think you get more on the answer. If they're anonymous versus confidential? Yeah. Because, I mean, if, if people don't have to disclose anything about who they are, yeah. then they're more apt to release information that may be completely honest versus partial. The, uh, yeah. That works for the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and you get, yeah. if, they're, if they're anonymous, you might get better responses. Um, but what I was talking about, you're kind of blurring the lines. You're actually, you're right, you're not blurring the lines. You say that it's going to be anonymous and you find a way to track it. That's not ethical. But the reason they would do that is one, I want to find out where I know the list of people I'm sending it to and I want to know from where they are. Just make that one of your research questions. What's your, you don't want to say what's your school because it doesn't take much to find out where their school is or where they work or things like that. But that's the reason people would do that. Just make it part of your question. What's another reason you would go confidential versus anonymous? Oh, I was just, I was just going to go on top of that and say like the technological technological age kind of makes everything at the tip of people's fingers. So if somebody says something wrong and they can track it back to that person, it can blow up and all of a sudden the entire nation knows that you said something wrong. Yeah. I was just tracking IP addresses. Rolling off of that, I was kind of it's it's scary how people can be like have to go into hiding and things. Yeah. What Aaron said is pretty much on target. Um, if I, if you don't even write my name down on it, and it's, in, if it's just check marks, and I know that you can't tell who said what, I'll give you a little, I'll be more forthright. But I trust you to not, I put my name to that answer, I might not be so forthright. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why an anonymity has a strength over confidentiality. Okay. Yeah. But if you would choose confidentiality instead of the other one. Anonymity. Yeah. That That's one. not fair. You guys quit saying that other word. I have to say it in front of all of you. Can you write it down? And I'm going to mail it to you. Because I want to say and then, and then from, 
And then we stick with the car for you. Is that wrong? Yeah, it's it's a big It's what? Google it now. All right, y'all. Are you on? I don't know how what the methodology is of my study, but like for this hypothetical example, I'm about to give you, but I would choose the benefits of confidentiality is knowing for sure that this is a real person that is giving me answers for my study. Because if something's anonymous, I don't know if the same person answered my, like, yeah, was a participant seven times, or if it's that person and then, like, I don't know if they said, hey, to their family members, like, you should participate too, and they all have the same ideas, mm -hmm. and it's not truly random or truly, um, I don't know what I'm saying. But I think if it's confidential, confidentiality, you know for sure that it's this one person and that you won't use them as a participant again. Okay. So it's a lie, it's not a lie. That's yeah. what I thought, but I was going to say, A-N-O-N-Y-M-I-T. It's like I couldn't spell it, and I tried. There. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, not only did I just say it, but I didn't spell it. Wouldn't that be no Wouldn't that be no whom? She's done half the class. What? Wouldn't that be no whom? No whom you're referring to? Oh, God. I won't critique your grammar. Um, so, couldn't there a case be made that confidentiality might, in some cases, like breed more trust? If you have a certain source, a certain confidential source that you go to for all of your uh, information, and they respond and eventually start to trust you more to give you more info, could that be a better source? Yes, it could. Um, on the other hand, if I keep going to the same source for all of my research, then there's the right. problem okay. that, okay, well, this is my source. And sure. I'm going to this person because they typically give me what I want. Okay. And then you're running into that. But yeah, I mean, it's going to breed some trust because they're going to be able to demonstrate to this person I don't breach it. Yeah. So basically, instead of those two words, you're basically going with uh, reliability versus uh, validity. Mm -hmm. Well, your confidentiality with, with the way you're speaking as far as with uh, what was said about uh, like duplicate answers or people answering this or getting other people to do the same answers as them, that tends to be unreliable. If you're confident, if you do with the confidentiality, you know who's answering, you know where your answer's coming from, so is it more reliable than it can be? Let me let me tell you for confidentiality, yes, I know know whom is responding to my study. Yeah, no who, that's right. Yeah, it is no he, who, that's yeah. right. It's no who. It'd be no to whom. But I know who is answering me. <laughs> Bottom killing me here. Um, also, if I want to do a comparative study, I had an idea when I did my dissertation, what I wanted to do is I wanted to survey the sports information directors and see how much influence they thought they had. And I wanted to, to survey their athletic directors and find out how much influence their sports information directors actually had. Okay? Now, I could get responses and look at the data for the sports information directors and compare it to the overall information for the ADs. But I wanted to see if I'm the AD and Chase is my sports information director, I wanted to see if we agreed or disagreed, how far apart we were. The only way to do that is to go with confidentiality because I need to be able to pair them up. And I'm, again, I'm not going to put on the survey, if I'm just going to go with anonymity, I'm not going to say, at what school do you work? Because there's only going to be one athletic director in one of those schools. They've just become confidential, not anonymous. There's only one sports information director in one of those schools. They've just gone from anonymous to confidential. Yeah. Okay. So if I want to do a comparison, I need to match everybody up. So I'm going to have to have confidentiality so that I can tell you I will not be using your name. I will, be not, I will not be using the school. What I want to find out is this number of matched pairs, there was a difference. 
this number of matched pairs, they agree with one another. And then try and find the correlations there. Does that make sense? I'm going to have to be able to know who it is. Another reason, so for matched pairs. Another reason for using confidentiality When I do quantitative research and I do the survey, I'm not going to say who it was who responded, but I want to be able to take some of these responses and I want to be able to follow up with people who actually follow to the survey. So I'm going to get my survey pool back. And then from that pool of responses, I may have surveyed 2,000 people and I got 375 responses. So from that 375, I want to randomly pick 15 and I want to do in-depth interviews with them. I can't do that if it's anonymous. I can if it's confidential because I have the names. So I randomly pick those 15, and those are the ones that I can then contact to do in-depth interviews so I have a mixed method. Make sense? Mike, you're looking perplexed. Uh, yeah, you still have a list of people who, you have 375 people who answered your survey. Their numbers aren't on. So you don't know which one's which, but still have a list of 375 people that you can still interview. No, because I don't know those 375 where they were from. I've got 2,000. That makes it random. Hmm? That doesn't add to the make it random. But I'm going to have to go to that whole 2,000 then and randomly pick my 15 from that 2,000, not from the 375 that responded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But at the same time, I'm still not releasing their names. I had a really nice visit with Phil Hoffman yesterday, who's the new director of uh, broadcast services, and we talked a lot about the ethicality of my freshman year. Because I saw him on his bookshelf, I said, "You read my freshman year?" He goes, "Yeah, I did." What do you think? I said, "I thought it was an interesting read. I read it for an ethnography class." He said, "Opens up a whole lot of discussion about ethics in, re in research." I said, hey, "You think?" <laughs> because she went native, got right down in there with the, in the trenches. Reported on these students. You know, somebody is going to know that she was doing her research. Somebody is going to find out what she did and possibly where she did it. And they could, you know, if there's any chance at all, somebody <coughs> can figure it out. You're pushing the limits, okay? Because they could find out where she went, do a little more investigating, and find out what room she was in, and what dorm she stayed in, and what classes she was taking, and they can match it up. So I think I told you she did have a couple of students who were really offended, felt like their privacy was invaded because she wasn't really a classmate. She was going to write about it, confidential, anonymous, or not. They were really offended by that and felt the the I, I come right back to you. The um, the impact doesn't have to be when the study is going on. The impact could be after the study is over, mm -hmm. when they find out what happened, mm -hmm. when somebody leaks it or somebody discovers what she's doing and they become offended or hurt or feel violated, that's harm. What role, if any, did the IRB play in that? They had to give her permission to do it or else she wouldn't have been able to do it. I think give somebody permission to go native when you know it's could potentially cause harm like that. You have to show a limited risk. And, there, and I'm sure they passed it along because it was limited risk. I mean, it's somebody's really going to have to want to know. They're really going to have to spend a lot of resources to go find out. So I'm sure they looked at it and said, there's risk. You need to do this, this, and this to mitigate that risk. You need to demonstrate you've done this, this, and this to mitigate that risk. Typically what we say when we do these, and it's the cheesiest thing in the world, my data will be locked in my desk, and I'm the only person with a key, and the research findings will be dis discarded and destroyed, shredded, burned. I mean, get specific what's going to happen with this data in three years. Or as soon as the, the work is published, my dissertation is published, the, the data will be destroyed. Really? Because we talk about your developing your line of research you're going to come back to some of that data. I mean, I've done three studies off my dissertation. So, but you have to demonstrate that you're going to mitigate the risk. Okay. 
One thing also to keep in mind, this is, deals with human subjects. So if you're doing document analysis and that's the only thing you're going to be doing, you're not talking to any individuals, you're not interviewing anybody, you're not doing any focus groups, if you're just using documents, like you're kind of giving me a, a squirrely look here, sure. you're, you're thinking about, let me, let me go quantitative. You're doing content analysis, you don't have to go through IRB because you're already looking at documents that are already in public record. You're already looking at documents that have been published for anybody in the world to see. Okay. Your diary, for instance, hmm? on this journal or diary to find to get information from them. That's the same as talking to the person. But the thing with looking at those types of things with their documents, their diaries, if you get permission from them or from their family, they've accepted to let it out there. And most of the time, when we think about doing a, a diary or a journal, it's one that's been somebody who's been famous, who's been who's laid it out into a museum. So it's public record anyway. Because when we think about doing document analysis, you're talking about public records. Where you get into the gray area is somebody who's alive now, and you're going through and looking at their email stream. And if you're going to look at people's email, if you're going to look at their Twitter posts, if you're looking at those types of things, you need permission because that is their material. Um, would you think that Twitter is public? I'm is sorry? Twitter is public, isn't it? So is for it is, to see. It is public and it is, there's again, there's the gray area that we have to do. We're still working our way through social media because it's public, <coughs> but it's meant to be, meant to be, for people I want to see it, you know? So I give you, whenever I go with Twitter, if I make it public, or if I go on Facebook, I have to make it public. I have to, and if I post something, I can post it and dictate, this is shown to my friends. Mm -hmm. But if you post it out there for the world to see, that's when you're kind of, that's the gray area, okay? I know this isn't specific to research, but like, if you put something on social media, for people that you want to see, and it's probably something that you wouldn't want your future employer to see, but then they see it and they're like, hmm, I don't want to, you know, hire you. This is, or oh, I want to fire you now because I see this. Like some people may argue, like you, that was not for your eyes, so you sh you shouldn't be able to fire me, or that shouldn't keep me from getting hired. But isn't it kind of almost the same thing? Like if if it's if you post Again, on that's social media, like, is that a gray area still? Like, the law and with IRB sort of thing, that's what we're still working through because it is so new. But I mean, I've had, you know, I had a student just last year who, F yeah, Royals posted it right out there. He had just graduated, he's trying to find a job. Uh, and I, I sent him a note and I said, you know, how many times have I told you, I know you're not my student anymore, but how many times have I told you this stuff gets out there and if it is seen by potential employers, you are hurting yourself. Want to be a sports announcer. And I mentioned his favorite sports announcer. I said, do you think he talks like that on social media? And he writes back, he probably doesn't even know social media. Moron, you're not getting the point. And I could say that anymore because he was one of my students. Moron, you're not getting the point. Somebody who does not like you, and I stopped short of saying, and there are a lot of people here who don't, Oh, could boy. post that out there on theirs. Well, he's a kid who made a lot of enemies for himself. All the tea there. Huh. Somebody else could post that out there for more people to see, and they may be followed by one of your potential employers. Because he kept making the argument, well, it's just for my friends to see. I can share that online, and I'm friends with a lot of people you want to be employed by. Yeah, one of my um, friends who left and went to go apply at uh, Raytown School District. Um, and during her interview, they actually pulled up somebody, another candidate's Facebook page and were looking at it oh. and gave her a reason why they weren't going to hire this person. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. well, talk, about, talk, about, talk about ethics. Would you want to work for that? Right! Yeah. That's what I said. But she took that job and she still works there for years now. But that's, you're, I mean, that's where you're flirting with it and you need to, that's where you're going to, I don't know all of this. Yeah. I don't have, I'm not, not been on the committee, I'm not steeped in what they've talked about, mm -hmm. I'm not a part of making the policies, so I don't know. But that's where you need to talk to that committee and say, I want to look at Twitter. And when you start talking about social media right now, that's where they're going to grill you. Because Alex may post something and yeah, it's public to his friends. But it's not public for the world. 
But if I see it and I share it, and now the researcher doesn't follow out, but they follow me and they see it, did he actually share it with the world? Or did he just share it with his friends? Now I share it. Right. And that's where you're running into the, so that's where even doing document analysis with social media, you're going to have to think about those things. Rachel, you have any Yeah. Um, slightly different, but this good transition. What is the limitations and the process for people talking about other people? For example, the second journal article review, my article is about um, these people interviewed healthcare professionals, mental health professionals, and they were talking about their clients. So it wasn't about the, in, the, the Did study. They no. But, like, in the article it said, yeah, there's a parent that does blah, 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 and their child blah, blah, blah. So what are the, the limitations? Well, what, can, if, what can people say about other people? Can you say whatever you want as long as you don't say a name? If you're interviewing your subjects that are part of your population, and they start talking about specific cases, or without, even without using names or whatever, it comes back to what is your what is your reasoning? Are you trying to find out how open they are about cases? Are you trying to find out about their patients? And I'm just looking like on your name. Catherine. 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 My gosh, I'm sorry. It's a cheese. She's off the wheel again. Catherine. She's <laughs> off the wheel again. <laughs> <laughs> I've been off coffee for about two weeks now, or about a week now. All right. <laughs> Catherine is your patient. Okay. And you start talking about Catherine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what is my purpose in doing this interview? And basically, what I'm what I'm saying is, Catherine will respond to me. She won't give me an interview. Okay. So I'm gonna go to you and get you to talk about Catherine. That's hearsay. Well, that's, that's, that's yeah. It's it's hearsay, so it's not necessarily all that accurate. Yeah. But that was the the purpose of the study was to find out how over involved parents are when their child when their grown child has a disability. Mm -hmm. So like parents that can't let go and let their children grow up because they have a disability. But instead of talking to parents with adult children with disabilities, the researchers talk to their um, mental health professionals. Probably because I'm not overprotective. I'd let them go, what are you talking about? You're not gonna get any kind of a response. They're gonna have to go to, to the mental health professional to talk about specific instances and what they see in their patients. Mm -hmm. As long as you're not naming names, as long as you're not providing information on them, that's okay. But it's the same sort of thing is you can't tell me Catherine's name because that's breaking uh, doctor-patient privilege. Well, yeah. So there's no problem with that? You can ask people about other people? Mm -hmm. As long as it's part of their profession. Now, if I'm coming to you and asking your opinions on, I don't know, something out of your kin, that's really not, it's, not, it's kind of pointless. Yeah. I can ask you about your opinions on the U.S. government. I can ask you your opinions on the president. I can ask you your opinions on the city council because I'm wanting to get people's opinions throughout the community about this body. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, there needs to be some sort of connection between why I'm interviewing you about this specific subject. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. My turn, Jeff, when you want to hear. Well, yeah, Sarah, Michael, did I leave anything out? Anything else you think we ought to know? We didn't talk about ethics in journalism or research. We talked about ethics in general in that class. So a lot of religious talk and uh, mores and good religions is more what we can discuss. So there's no germane. Okay. All right. The, the point is, number one, point I'm trying to make, number one, recognize you're going to have a bias. Recognize that to be a good researcher, you need to be an ethical listener, recognizing that you need to be prepared to be proven wrong or to accept that people have other opinions that are counter to yours. And when you're doing your results, you need to share that as equally as you do the points of view that agree with you. I recognize that if you are proven wrong, if your hypothesis is disproven, that is okay as long as you're adding to the body of knowledge. Number two, recognize that anonymity and confidentiality have their purposes. 
and you need to be clear with your subjects which one you're going with and then stick to it. And number three, if you're going to be dealing with people, you have to go through the IRB and talk to somebody that you know or through your department or your college who's on, on IRB, give them an idea of what it is you're doing so they can tell you which process to go through. Okay?